Hello, everybody, um, online and offline. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we will wait another few minutes because our uh, second speaker, who is uh, here with us, uh, hasn't arrived yet, uh, Mr. Inginger from uh, DigiTrade. No problem. So apparently, uh, Ms. Twininga, uh, she uh, for some reason thought this would be online. So she will join us in a minute. Um, I, I, it was pretty clear that it was not, but I think uh, we uh, also will now start uh, the policy dialogue because, um, yeah, it's already five past. Um, so, um, yeah, once again, from my side, uh, a very warm welcome here at the EPC uh, for the policy dialogue, uh, Building International Alliances for Green Industrial Policy. Uh, my name is Philip Lausberg, and I'm a policy analyst here at the EPC's uh, Political Economy Programme. And, um, yeah, for, ma for, for many years, the EU has been seen as a global a leader in climate and green policy. Um, in 2019, under the Green Deal, the EU has pledged to, to become the first climate neutral uh, continent by 2050. And it has also always aspired to um, facilitate uh, the reduction of CO2 uh, elsewhere in the world. Um, external climate uh, policy was done mainly through rules and carbon, uh, carbon tax. But since the supply chain disruptions during the, the, the crisis in the past years, uh, a new model has uh, massively won in popularity, and that's green industrial policy. Um, countries across the developed world have launched ambitious industrial policy uh, initiatives to push transition towards green industry, not only for sustainability reasons, but also for economic security uh, considerations. Um, the most uh, famous of these programs is probably the US uh, IRA, which uh, uh, earmarks $369 billion uh, for, uh, for the clean industry in the U.S. But they also, uh, the Chinese have been doing industrial policy for a while already um, with uh, subsidies. Uh, Japan has a green a transition bonds program and the EU's various uh, programs encapsulated in the Green Deal. Uh, and it's recently announced uh, Green Deal industrial plan uh, have uh, earmarked similar amounts of money. So while these developments have been hailed uh, as a progress towards a more sustainable future. Um, they are also being criticized as being protectionist. Um, so 
discriminatory elements uh, and uh, local content requirements can in fact hamper green industrial development in disadvantaged uh, countries and forego synergies in the production of sustainable technologies and renewables. This can come at the expense of the planet and at the cost of countries with less abilities to effectively subsidize the development of green industri industries, such as, for example, in the global south. But a more confrontational geoeconomic and trade environment, which we are seeing now, can also negatively affect EU plans for the green transition. The EU is dependent on critical raw materials and in other inputs from abroad, while experiencing a challenge to its competitiveness and its business model based on free trade. So the main questions that we will discuss today um, are twofold. Number one, how can the EU secure partnerships? It, it needs to achieve the goals of the Green Deal and the Green Industrial Plan, um, and which partners it should engage with that and which goods and services should be included. And second, how can the EU and its partners facilitate green industrial development across the globe in the context of increasing geoeconomic confrontation? For this discussion, we have uh, assembled a um, panel with uh, a, a distinguished panel, and I'm, I'm now having the pleasure to introduce to you um, I don't know if uh, Ms. Tuingia is, yes, she is, she is here. She has joined us. Welcome, thank you for joining. So this is uh, Madeleine Tuingia. She's head of unit for multilateral trade and sustainable development policy, the Green Deal, conflict manner and, and conflict minerals at DG Trade. Then um, also joining us online, um, but I don't see her. So I will uh, continue with, um, um, yeah, here we go. So there is uh, also Monica Araya, Executive Director for International Affairs at the European Climate Foundation. Um, then I have also the pleasure to introduce to you Seung Ju Lee, um, who is Professor of Political Science at the Institute of the National Interest at Chung Ang University in South Korea. And last but not least, um, here at the EPC in the room we have uh, Marion Janssen, Director of the Trade and Agricultural Directorate of the OECD. So thank you everybody for uh, making it into the panel. Um, I would like to, uh, before I start the discussion, also point out that in the end there will be a QA session, but if you are joining us online, you can also start uh, asking questions uh, uh, by typing them in already during the discussion. Um, I will, I will begin to uh, ask, uh, to turn to uh, Mr. Ingia. Um, so can you tell us what is the state of play and what are the plans for EU green industrial, industrial and also critical raw materials partnerships across the world? Um, and then maybe also what role international institutions can play in that and uh, yeah, what these partnerships should actually contain. Thank you, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I'm unmuted by the most. <laughs> thank you so much for this introduction and thank you for the invitation. And I'm, I really apologize not being there. I had understood it was online actually. Um, but so next time I'm pleased to join in real life. Uh, you, you give me five minutes, which is a true challenge. Um, so let me just um, briefly set the scene. Um, green industrialization, which for some sort of, and this is the way you pitched it also, looks like a, a controversy, but we are, we, are, we are marrying here green with industrialization and what we do internally in the EU and the external, external dimension. I think that that's the essence of the crossroads we're looking at. It is, for me, the starting point is always that the, these are decisive times for climate and biodiversity, and we've set ourselves ambitious international objectives. That's actually what we're doing and we're talking about. The question is not if, but how we take measure and build alliances. For Europe, this basis is the European Green Deal. Um, it sets out the uh, green transitions and its ambitions, including time, uh, climate targets towards net zero by 2050. Um, um, we've set the frame by Fit for 55, Repower EU uh, plan to accelerate the move away from fossil fuels, the circular economy, 
And now we've complemented this with a Green Deal industrial plan for a net zero age to stay ahead of the game. And that has four pillars, um, this plan, predictable and simplified regulatory environment, faster access to uh, sufficient funding skills, and, and this is probably where our conversation comes in, open and trade for resilient supply chains. Um, at this moment, and you, you, you alluded to one, um, uh, we've, uh, as part of this industrial plan, um, uh, we have the Net Zero Industry Act, and we presented the Critical Raw Materials Act, and a couple, a couple of other, other ones. Now, where does it bring us in, in terms of international alliances? Um, I'm going to briefly touch on the different levels that we are working. So, um, but the, all these actions, what we can do internationally, and then certainly with a trade hat on, on, on my head, um, we can take action to facilitate trade in green goods and services. So facilitate the access, um, uh, make the, sure that the, 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 the green and goods and services can circulate. Secondly, we look after the rules of the game, uh, whether you talk uh, subsidies or rules ensuring uh, fair trade, um, address barriers, but I would also say rules of the game in new areas. Um, uh, the way climate measures are designed or the way other green, uh, green policies are designed in an open way and no protectionism. So trade offers rule setting, liberalization, enforcing fair rules of the game and a platform for deliberations. Now the areas um, to run through them, WTO for me, actually the best alliances should come from the multilateral. Um, after all, we are dealing with global challenges. Um, we've presented a WTO reform, which has a strong green and industrial uh, dimension. Um, I can mention subsidies, which is in our, our paper, but also the Committee on Trade and Environment that we want to push forward as a forum for transparency and deliberations. And there's a lot of work, uh, WTO related work in plurilaterals. Um, we have the so-called structured discussions um, on sustainability questions, uh, where our discussions focus on the facilitation of trade in goods and services, a lot on how do we design and implement climate measures, <coughs> um, but also things like uh, what you were discussing now, definition of products, what are actually um, uh, uh, clean, uh, clean products um, and services. Um, plurilateral outside WTO context, also number four, we have uh, G7 work uh, as recently, uh, I mean, at this moment we're working on um, uh, strengthening clean energy supply chains for decarbonization and economic security, uh, which has just um, come out, uh, the um, work uh, that we've been doing in the OECD context. Um, on G7, there, there's a lot of work and within the G7, we are also discussing climate club um, that is now being expanded. Um, I can get back to that if there are questions. Um, of course, what is ahead of us, and you alluded to it, is the critical raw materials. Von der Leyen, President von der Leyen announced the Critical Raw Material Club, um, that we will create a forum um, for consuming and producing countries to unlock the production extraction of, of critical materials for green production. And we are reflecting on ways on how producing and consuming countries um, could come together in this club in a way that has an added value to existing initiatives. Um, and there will be a prominent sustainable angle to this as well. Uh, bilaterally, uh, to name a few, of course, there's a lot of work in uh, and cooperation going on in uh, free trade agreements. Um, uh, and all these angles come together in a bilateral, whether it is liberalization or the function of a platform. On top of it, in our FTAs, we have energy and raw materials chapters, which are also very relevant for this discussion. Um, and then maybe finally to say autonomous measures, of course, they are internally, but they have a significant external dimension. So what we are actually doing together with the lead services is develop an external strategy of the EU internal measures, if you want. Um, to at least those that have a strong um, external dimension. Now, maybe to end, um, 
none two points. Um, none of these initiatives are perfect. Uh, you will see overlaps. I think at this moment there's a bit of a mushrooming also of initiatives I haven't mentioned. For example, one that um, in the trade has emerged now, that which is in the trade um, trade ministers for climate um, initiative that is halfway linked to the WTO, but also more broadly. But just to say there, there, there are many initiatives mushrooming um, and, and we will need to see how they um, interact and how each of them get, gets into the added value. Um, and maybe as a final point for reflection, of course, we realize that there's a challenge huh, to reconcile a growth model, model a growth um, green model with external policy action in third countries. Um, we think that we are front runners, um, but there are others that may say, and I've experienced that quite a lot in, in on some of the policies that the first question is, is the EU protectionist? I don't think so. That this, this shows how important it is to build international alliance, uh, alliances. Um, I think the bottom line that not doing anything is not an option um, and, and that we need to bring uh, partners along um, uh, on our way. And in, in fact, many are also developing a similar growth model. So there is a, certainly an interest to, to engage on that. Um, so with that, um, I think I filled five minutes to try to, to get through this, but happy to take questions. Thank you very much. Um, that was a very nice overview of yeah, the, the agenda of the EU when it comes to partnerships uh, on uh, green industrial policy and, and, and trade. Um, I would like now to turn to uh, Ms. Araya. Um, how can the EU Green Deal industrial plan and EU partnerships around the world, and particularly with countries in East Asia and, glo and, and the Global South, help to promote the green transition worldwide? And how should such partnerships be structured to have a maximum positive effect for the climate and the environment? Thank you, Philip, and, and thank you, Madeleine, for the remarks. Um, I have three big points in, in five minutes, so I, I'll, I'll, I'll get to the, to the point at the end. Before, before I do that, I just wanted to tell you where I come from so that you know we all have a point of view. So I am living in Europe, I am based in Oslo, and I was born in Costa Rica, and I have lived for many years in, in various European countries. So, so my perspective will be ECF, the European Climate Foundation, but as you can imagine, being from, from Latin America, uh, from a very rich uh, region, and when it comes to natural resources, gives me a, a point of view, and my point is that I, I want to help build bridges, because this is, number one, a big moment of redefinition. We are rethinking alliances. We are rethinking a lot of assumptions about security, about the way the world works. I think that the war has had a, a very deep impact in a lot of the thinking inside the European Climate Foundation and in Europe more generally. Uh, it has opened our eyes to a lot of the backlash that there is out there when it comes to some of the emerging markets in Africa, Latin America, and Asia, we need to unpack where that is coming from and why it's very much related to natural resources, to history, and to many other dimensions. So, so the point is that in this moment of redefinition, we have a very interesting puzzle because the, a lot of these challenges are happening right when the clean technologies that we need from a climate perspective are getting bigger better. So this leads me to this. I, I cannot elaborate, but happy to do that in the questions and in discussion. The point is that the landing point for this complexity is that we are facing uh, in the climate space a political question that we did not have to face three or four or five years ago, which was where is the clean technology being produced? And clearly there was something about the IRA being about building that technology in the US, having implications for Europe that, that present to all of us a very difficult question, which is, okay, if you have to sustain clean tech development in Europe and in the US because of domestic reasons, because you need to sell this to the public saying it will be built here, we all have to recognize that what gets to Chile what gets to South Africa, what gets to the Philippines is the idea that, oh, okay, so you want us to buy all the technology from Europe and the US. And that is not something that um, a lot of countries are taking in the most, um, in the most enthusiastic way. So 
here is why these partnerships are so important. And I see a lot of opportunities. So even though it's difficult, and even though I see a lot of challenges, uh, and yes, there is a Western backlash, I, I do mention this not to, to, to suggest this is impossible to solve. So here are some observations based on the discussions we have at ECF, the granting we're doing and dialogues we are engaging in um, internationally. So um, one point that I wanted to, to emphasize, and again, not in the defeatist sense, but more in the sense of opportunity that we need to grow, um, is that there is a still lack of clarity out there, outside the EU, about the actual value proposition of the EU vis-a-vis, -vis, say, a country like Chile. So for example, think about it like this. If you put the president of Chile, Boric, very young, with a lot of lithium, as you know, in Chile, the largest uh, deposits, uh, the largest reserves in the, of lithium in the planet. And you asked him, Mr. President, you have to choose a partner. And it's either China, the US, Europe. The question is, why would he choose Europe? What is the, the what, in essence, what is the value proposition? Is it clean tech plus a contract, so, a, a social contract? Is that it because it's clean tech in a, in a very solid market with very clear rules? Is it because we share values? You know, I, I'm not saying that there is nothing, that the value proposition is not there. I'm saying, even though there are very good elements, and I agree with Madeleine that it, if anything is measuring very fast, the, the, the very important question for Europe right now in this moment of definition is to be very clear of what the essence of the value proposition is. So, because I'll run out of time, I'll mention some of the elements that could be very important to unpack and in, in, in to some degree to supercharge. Because um, as you know, um, many of these countries are being offered and are being, um, are basically dealing with a lot of investment also from China. Latin America, I, we can have an, another day of conversation about that. Very happy to do that. Number one, there is something about supercharging the trade and diplomacy agenda. And as, 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 as we heard before, there is a lot going on, a lot of goodwill in, in the engagement, the bilateral engagements. engagements. And yet right now, um, there is um, more room to, to think about the positive agenda. How do we use trade rules to do more of the, the good things, the good technology, and less of the bad ones, the, the, the blue team one, the ones that are not good from, from a Paris Agreement perspective? I think the EU-Chile agreement is something that we should uh, look into. I think we need good examples because when I interact in the, in the climate space, there is a sense that, again, I'm just... It's a perception, a strong perception um, that the EU is using trade more in the sense of um, the, the more uh, punishing agenda. And, and, and my point is, we have to think about the, the positive one. What is it that trade can help us in the context of EU Chile to, for example, uh, when it comes to domestic production in some of the key countries, uh, how can we be flexible? Um, to give you an idea of how we're working this out, we had, for example, a dialogue recently between the US and EU governments and experts trying to figure out how to you know, deal with domestic politics and trade and at the same time be flexible. There is also, um, in, I agree with, with the previous point on the WTO. My first job was in the trade ministry in Costa Rica. So I'm, I, um, I, I, I completely agree with the idea that the WTO is a place where we need to um, reimagine a lot of things, even though it's super difficult. And, and there is now a better chance than several years ago because of the leadership there. So I think um, in terms of concrete things we're doing, we're granting um, and we're, we're not ECF, is the guarantee that are creating a lot of dialogues. And I would be very happy to bring some of the, the insights here because it's so important. Another area, of course, is the standards. I think we have somebody from the OECD here. As you know, in the developing world, you have very different categories of countries. We say Global South. Um, I'm a bit allergic sometimes to that categorization because it misses the fact that you have some OECD countries there. You have very sophisticated conversations on mining. So in terms of the standards, the EU obviously is in a very good position to 
not only create standards in Europe that could diffuse, but also co-create some of them with key countries that are having very deep discussions about the role of mining, human rights, and who want to do things right. Um, so, so the nuance there is super important. And then the other one that is difficult, uh, and I face this all the time when I go to Latin America and I talk to my African colleagues, is that they say, fine, more trade, lots of diplomacy, standards, great. But where is the money? Where is the fine? Not the money in the sense of UN climate finance. Where is the investment? Where are the trade flows? So for example, in terms of trade, uh, the trade between Latam and, and China in the last 20 years has increased 21.5 times compared to the trade between Latam and in, in, in EU, which grew only two times, uh, twice. So, so in other words, we need more companies in Europe also investing in these markets. That is what is creating a lot of the glue for this conversation in electrification, when it comes to renewables, when it comes to green hydrogen. So I think the combination of diplomacy trade, uh, standards and investments is, is, is the package that a lot of them are putting on the table. I hope I didn't go over too many minutes. Thank you. I'm happy to elaborate too, thank you. Thank you very much. That was very insightful. It was very, um, yeah, you covered a lot of ground there. So, um, yeah, the, the whole complex of how to deal uh, with cooperation when it comes to, to countries outside Europe, I think you really summed it up pretty well. And also the role of international uh, organizations, of course, and that's also why I'm turning now to, to our next panelist, um, Ms. Janssen from the OECD. Um, can maybe elaborate a little bit on how she sees that the OECD uh, uh, can help to facilitate international cooperation on green industrial policy, both among its members, but also beyond, and uh, what kind of tools uh, it can use, and, and what the chances are for the future that this could actually become one of the fora in the world that uh, would push uh, this ahead. Thank you, Philip, and very pleased to be uh, here with you today. Well, um, Monica gave me a good bridge. She said we need to look at the package of diplomacy, trade, standards, and investment. And um, I will be happy to explain to you why we offer at the OECD um, that package. Um, I also used the opportunity to um, make reference to the fact that I think the, all the three representatives in this, um, in this panel uh, are part of the membership of the OECD. I assume, Song Zhu, that you are maybe of Korean uh, origin. South Korea is, uh, the Republic of Korea is a member of the OECD. Uh, Costa Rica is a member of the OECD, and so is Chile, Monica mentioned. And uh, the European Union is not really a member, it's individual countries that are members, but the European Union um, is part of our, um, of our collaborators and um, has a very specific status at the OECD. Um, we just published today, so very timely that I'm here, a report that we produced for the G7, and that it's called Strengthening Clean Energy Supply Chains for Decarbonization and Economic Security. And that's not the first time we work with the G7 and for the G7 on green transition and resilient supply chains. Um, we have been doing this for a number of years now. And what this title, I think, signals is one of the tensions that previous speakers already referred to. We are currently in a world where many countries and definitely all our members are interested in a green transition. Um, but we're at the same time, we are in, an econ in a geopolitical context that has changed and where several of many of our members are concerned about security of access. Um, now, what can in this context be the role of the OECD? I already said that all our members believe in the need for green transition. And then when it comes to security of access, well, we have in our membership countries that have access uh, that produce important critical raw materials. Chile was already mentioned, but there is Canada, United States, Australia, um, and other countries are rather um, strong net importers. The European Union is uh, rather dependent on critical raw materials from elsewhere. Now, that's important because for this green transition, there are certain raw materials that we absolutely need. 
So for the European Union to want to move very green and at the same time have access, um, being able to do it by having access to these raw materials, that's tricky. Currently, the European Union buys uh, most of its rom relevant raw materials from non-OECD countries. And its dependency on some of these countries, I'm thinking of China notably, is something that many countries in the European Union are currently worried about. Um, so that's why um, increasingly there is um, a collaboration in the context of the G7 around these issues, and that, what we are, that's where we are working on. But we consider that um, it would also be interesting for all of our members and DAFN in the EU to consider to have a, a stronger collaboration more broadly with the OECD as a whole on these matters, notably because we share um, values and we have both suppliers and buyers of critical materials in our membership. Let me come back to these buzzwords, diplomacy, trade, standards, investment, and explain across three um, themes how we are currently working on these topics. First, when it comes to critical raw materials for the green um, transition, we are analyzing what kind of raw materials are needed, who is buying which raw materials from where within our membership, externally to the membership, and as I already mentioned, have been doing this at a very political level for the, G, uh, for the G7. And we are currently discussing with our members how to move further um, at the OECD level. Doing this is not easy because uh, those of you who are economists, how many economists are in the room? Oh, not, so, not so many. You know, those, if you have done trade, our trade models actually don't help us to analyze what is happening in the supply chain. We are con constantly being asked now, how can I identify the next problem in my supply chain? And we actually don't have models for this, not only at the OECD, not in Brussels either, not in Washington and not in Tokyo. So one of the things that we have been doing in the past two years is bring chief economists from trade ministries and, and, and other ministries, uh, Department of State, to Paris and discuss together, what are you currently doing? Which methodology are you using? Which data? How can we as fast as possibly, as quickly as possible, move forward and help policymakers? So a strong agenda on this critical raw materials and understanding who depends on whom and how can we create for our members the most comfortable situation. That was one thing. The second theme, the role of standards, and Monica already made reference to this. Um, we work in the, in the OECD, we have a trade directorate, I lead that, but we also have an environment directorate. And uh, we have science directorates. We have many directorates, notably, who are active in the um, area of setting standards. Um, the responsible business conduct guidelines that have been influencing heavily the responsible business conduct guidelines that the European Union is um, currently considering to make mandatory, that my home country, Germany, made mandatory. Uh, those guidelines were very much developed at the OECD. We were the precursor for this, and they are taking over international laws now. So standard setting happens at the OECD um, because we have relevant experts who can help with this. And um, we have a lot of members who share values. And if you agree jointly on the same standard, at least you can continue to trade among each other. So a lot of pro progress there on working jointly on standards. Not everything is rosy because um, even though we discuss these things together, countries have different policies. And when these policies differ too much, we find it hard to trade with each other. Um, I give you, um, I, I give you an, an, an example. Um, we, um, the responsible business conduct guidelines, for instance, that have become, are becoming mandatory now in a country like Germany. Many countries that are members of the OECD do not understand how this will be implemented. For instance, if I'm exporting grains to Germany, and I'm supposed to show that these grains have been produced in a green way or in a socially helpful way, um, I have to be able to tra trace them back to the farmer. But those, that's already difficult. It's always difficult to trace back. But if the grains at some stage in the process are thrown into a container, how do I identify which grain comes from which farmer? So implementation of these kinds of rules is complicated, is not clear sometimes, and this creates is starting to create frictions and trade costs. Not for 
not out of bad will, but out of lack of clarity in the implementation. There are other areas that are moving into fragmentation. Um, one example is what uh, companies are doing in terms of carbon footprint monitoring. Many multinationals now are being requested because of the COP process, the famous scope three assessment, um, or because um, um, accountants are asking them to do so. If they want to be listed in a stock exchange, they have to report on their carbon footprint. And many are doing it. But um, one multinational recently told me, that, uh, they said, we are reporting and we use a methodology, but I know that my competitor uses another methodology. And I'm afraid that tomorrow an auditor comes and tells me, how come you are doing different things? Which of you, who is of you is, to, is telling the truth? Or I have a method of measuring. I want to buy from a supplier. The supplier measures in a different way. How do I add this up? We have in this world of carbon footprint now measurement, now a lot of activity, and it's great, fantastic dynamic, but it's chaotic. And again, uncertainty and chaos is creating frictions. As the OECD, we offer to our members to come to the OECD, discuss not only among countries, but also among stakeholders. So for discussions like this, we bring together governments, private sector players, standard setters, standard setters from the from the real world, from the agricultural sector, but also standard sectors from the financial world. So that was the second area. First one was, uh, how do we work on critical raw materials for the green transition? Second one, what can we do? What are we doing on standards? And the third one, industrial policy makes us think of subsidies, of paying in order to uh, support a transition. Now, that a transition is costly and that governments may want to help is maybe something we can consider okay. Even so, I'm from the generation where industrial policy was a blasphemy to even use that word. But, but let's say it's okay. But if we have a situation, and we may be in that situation currently, if multiple countries start to subsidize in order to uh, be stronger and subsidize more than another partner, then we enter into a subsidy race. And this, I tell you, is bad. And it's definitely bad for taxpayers. And in a, in a period where uh, taxpayers and in general the public is already not in a great position, this is something governments should think about. At OECD, we bring governments together to discuss subsidies and to agree on how to jointly find this optimal level. And we've recently, and we are very proud of this, uh, managed to agree on a deal in the area of export credits where our members agreed, what do we call a green project? Um, and how can we uh, give easier access to credits for green projects? And what is the level of easy access we give? And I think these are ideal outcomes. Agree that you want to help, but also agree on how you do it in order not to enter into harmful competition. So uh, in a nutshell, we work at the analytical level, we work at the standard setting level, we negotiate already deals in the trade and environment um, um, field, and we invite all our members and definitely the EU to use us as much as possible in this difficult period. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, overview of the role of the OECD when it comes to uh, green standards, but also industrial policy coordination. And, and, and then uh, the last uh, point that you mentioned um, uh, was, uh, yeah, basically, thank you very much for that. Um, I would now like to also turn to um, uh, Mr. Lee from South Korea who uh, can maybe tell us a little bit of uh, how South Korea is actually seeing um, the challenges of industry, green industrial policy at the moment, uh, how it's managing its green industrial partnerships and um, yeah, um, how it can also, how, where does it see its uh, the opportunities to cooperate with the EU on uh, green industrial policy? Yeah, thank you, Philip. Uh, yeah, first of all, I would like to thank you, EPC and Philip, for inviting me to this important and timely seminar and giving me a chance to share my thoughts and ideas about uh, uh, South Korea's green industrial policy. Uh, given that uh, today's topic is building international alliances for green industrial policy, I would like to 
pretty much focus on the green industrial policy of South Korea. Particularly, I would like to highlight the uh, several important changes made by the current Yoon Song Yeol government uh, in compared to the previous Moon Jae-in government. Actually, uh, if you look at the uh, policy stance uh, made by the Korean government, actually, green industrial policy has proceeded in two direct two directions. One is that the Korean New Deal comprehensive plan, and the second one is 2050 carbon neutrality promotion strategy. Actually, those two policy stance and the policy guidelines were created by the previous Moon Jae-in government. So if you look at the uh, like, uh, 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 policy guidelines. So there, there uh, it looks like there has been uh, kind of like uh, some limited changes made by the current government. But if we look into the details of the specific policies, there should be some uh, substantial differences between the previous and the current governments. So uh, in terms of the differences, I would like to say that the, the previous uh, Moon Jae-in government actually tried to raising NDC by 40%. And the focus of the green industrial policy was on to how to develop the pollution treatment industry. Uh, by contrast, the current Yoon Song Yeol government actually redefines green industry as a new growth engine of the Korean economy, now focuses on the high value added uh, sector of the green industries. So the current government actually tries to reduce the uh, technology gap with the uh, leaders in this in this field. Actually, the by the Korean government estimation, uh, the technological gap between Korea and the advanced countries is about 3.7 years, and the current government will try to shrink that gap to 20 point, uh, 2.6 years by 2017. Uh, uh, 20, uh, 27. And also current government aims to nurture green industry as an export industry. And uh, uh, particularly, uh, Korean government set a very specific target to boost the amount of export in this area to uh, 75 US billion dollars over the next five years. And that is about uh, uh, 10 times increase compared to the previous uh, government's uh, goal. And the third pillar of the current government to uh, in the uh, green industrial policy is that uh, uh, it is definitely required to increase the number of environmental technology related experts. So go government, Korean government tried to increase that number up to 180,000 uh, people. So in that regard, the, those uh, three policy pillars will bring in substantial changes from the previous government. And another uh, change made by the current government is that uh, uh, in the previous government, actually, the Korea tries to gradually phase out the nuclear power generation. But now current government tries to consider nuclear power generation and renewable energy in a more balanced uh, manner. So uh, because the current government is interested in uh, nurturing export industry, particularly in the areas of the next generation, Korean advanced nuclear reactor. It, this uh, reactor was already exported to UAE. And also, as demonstrated in the Korea-US uh, bilateral summit uh, two weeks ago, actually, Korean government aims to boost uh, or export uh, small modular reactors. Those are the two uh, main areas related to the nuclear power generation. And that, again, the current government tries to uh, boost it as uh, one of the uh, export engine of the uh, current uh, green industries. And in terms of govern governance, I would like to highlight that uh, uh, there are two government ministries in charge of green industrial policy. One is that the Ministry of Environment. Actually, uh, under the current government, actually Ministry of Environment tries to strengthen the industrial policy functions. Uh, uh, for the good side, actually, uh, this kind of uh, uh, policy uh, structure uh, actually contributes to unifying policymaking process and uh, streamline the po uh, policymaking uh, structures. But uh, for the bad side, actually, uh, some environmental protectionists criticize that the, the policy priority was on industrial promotion rather than environmental protection. So there are both good and bad side on this uh, uh, 
government uh, government structural change. So some critical uh, experts and scholars uh, tend to argue that the current environmental ministry is trying 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 to turn into the Ministry of Environment and Industry. And uh, second, uh, government ministry in charge of the green industrial policy is that the Ministry of SME and startups. Actually, that uh, ministry tries to unveil the Green Innovative Company Support Program. Uh, under this program, uh, the Ministry of SMEs and startups tries to support the green venture programs and then uh, here, po policy focus was on the discovering venture companies that can produce or develop green products and technologies. And then also uh, under the Ministry of SMEs and Startups, uh, the Korean government tries to foster uh, small and medium-sized companies into the global level specialist in the areas of env environmental technologies. Another goal is that uh, uh, create new jobs uh, in the in the process of boosting the green uh, technologies and industries, that kind of uh, job is under the uh, function of the Ministry of SMEs and Startups. Having said that, I, I would like to also highlight that the uh, Korean government is very much interested in uh, restructuring the government uh, governance, particularly tries to uh, increase the uh, public-private partnership, PPP. Actually, a uh, couple of months ago, actually, the Ministry of Environment launched the Public-Private Green Industry Export Alliance. That is the clash case of the public-private partnership. Uh, actually, in this alliance, uh, private companies, public enterprises, and export finance finance institutions join and uh, sign the agreement, which is called business agreement to vitalize the green industry. So here, Korean government tried to uh, provide the support the Korean green industry uh, with uh, uh, various kinds of financial assistance that can join the, this alliance. Uh, particularly, uh, South Korean government tries to provide the support by holding high level talks with the counterparts in other countries. For example, in Oman, uh, Korean government is very much interest to, interested in exporting green hydrogen technology. And with the UAE and Indonesia, uh, Korean government and private companies try to export the seawater desalination technologies. And with Uzbekistan, uh, Korea is trying to export landfill gas power generation and also seaweed treatment. For that kind of export, uh, both public and private partners uh, make a, a very close cooperation and collaboration. So that is one of the uh, go governance changes that made uh, for the last year or two. Mm, and also I would like to say that uh, this year, January of this year, actually Ministry of uh, Environment uh, promoted the so-called 2023 work plan. Uh, in this plan, Korean government actually presented three green new industries as main pillars of green industrial policy. Here, the three new areas are carbon neutrality, circular economy, and water industry. Uh, and the main contents is that the Korean government tries to take advantage of carbon strategy as a chance to leapfrog uh, from the previous stage to the next stage of the environmental technology. And also, the Korean government tries to nurture three green, green new industries, uh, as I illustrated just a minute, uh, seconds ago. And the third pillar is that the Korean government is also interested in preventing floods and droughts and establishing an environmental safety net in daily life. That is the uh, uh, policy goals unveiled by the uh, Ministry of Health environment uh, three months ago. And the last month, the uh, Korean government also uh, announced that uh, it will invest uh, 10 trillion won uh, in US dollars, 7.5 US billion dollars actually in green technology to develop the uh, green industries by 2027 and also uh, try to train 180,000 green professionals. This is the uh, 
very recent policy uh, uh, packages announced by the Korean government. Underneath this plan, actually, Korean government uh, uh, unveiled that the, uh, about the, uh, 10 trillion won, again, the 7.5 billion US dollars to uh, to nurture the and environment technology development, thank industry, you very, and human thank you very much, development. Mr. Lee. Um, I, I, I really don't uh, enjoy interrupting you, but uh, we need to also uh, cover a lot of more ground. So um, yeah. I think you, you, you all were at your last point. Um, thanks very much for this uh, very extensive overview of, of uh, Korean, uh, Korean industrial policy and also international partnerships. Um, I would like to now open the discussion of the, of the panel. And I think um, one of the interesting points that uh, uh, Mr. Raya raised uh, was how can the EU actually offer something to uh, countries uh, in, in, in Africa, in, in, in Middle East, in, in, in South America, that uh, is attractive to them, that lets them actually uh, do partnerships with, with, uh, with the European Union instead of, uh, let's say, Russia or China? And I think that's, uh, that's a key question if we, if we want to look at how the EU is supposed to get their real materials, but also um, yeah, the, 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 the value, other parts of the value chain um, uh, industrial partnerships. So um, I think uh, I will point this question uh, first as, uh, at uh, Mr. Tuningia. Maybe you, have, uh, you can tell us what, uh, what the Commission views on that. Okay, if I think uh, uh, Ms. Tuingia has a problem with her, with her internet, I would then, um, oh yeah, now, now you're back. Okay, great. Um, yes, sorry, but uh, I have on and off um, a connection issue. Could you repeat the question? Question sorry. is, uh, what can the EU offer to uh, third countries uh, in the so-called Global South? Um, what can it offer that uh, they will do actually these partnerships on raw materials, on green industrial policy with the EU? Because uh, at the moment, especially after the invasion uh, of, of, of Ukraine by Russia, uh, there is a lot of uh, call, uh, talk of hypocrisy in, 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 in many countries in the global south that the EU is basically just caring about their own um, uh, uh, problems and it is not really uh, prioritizing their conflict. I mean, this is uh, some of the arguments that I, I usually uh, named and that uh, why shouldn't they not cooperate with China or Russia instead? So uh, what can the EU actually offer those countries? Yes, I, I don't think that we will have a one size fix, fits all. I, and I, I recognize, um, and this is what I tried to open also in my, in my opening at the end, I recognize that there are sort of, it, 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 it appears that this whole problematic is coming as an either or. Um, and, and in some cases in the trade for, we are even discussing and going as far as some countries saying you cannot take climate measures. Um, no, I think we always need to start from the premise that there is a global climate and biodiversity challenge to which we all committed and that we then subsequently implement that. Um, I mean, I think to a large extent, it's a perception issue. We, we need to, to move ahead and we need to make sure that the EU um, complies with its net zero. That this is why we've put all these, these plans in place, but it doesn't mean that we do that in isolation on a country. And I think on multiple fronts, we are precisely looking for this engagement. In the WTO, certainly, we are integrated development as part and parcel in our WTO reform, that that needs to be part of it. So in, in, in that area, the discussions will go along with, if you talk about facilitation of green goods and services, how do you do that? I don't have all the answers now, but that's what we need to unravel. Um, uh, what are their needs? What I hear is a bit reflecting some of what, what the previous uh, um, discussion said. Um, for example, I want access to uh, clean technologies or well, let us discuss this. Um, other point that was also mentioned, the whole discussion on, on industrial subsidies, how, how do you make sure that that doesn't become a race to the bottom with unfair subsidies, but that that is an, uh, a, a fair, uh, fair uh, underpinned by fair rules of the game. Whether we talk WTO, whether we talk uh, the, the climate fora or elsewhere, the questions of money that are here comes up. For me, that's a big pot. It, it is capacity building. We have a huge amount of capacity building. The EU is the biggest donor, the EU together with member states. And the green, the whole, the, the green deal is 
a top priority within that. We, for every single measure, we are designing an external strategy which has a very strong um, capacity building component uh, for which we work a lot by the way with the OECD um, also with the ILO uh, with the ITC and other international organizations so we are we are very keen on doing that in, in based on international um, uh, practices um, that um, access are here also um, investments and access to investment. Of course, if, if you want to attract investor to your country, trade can help in the sense that this more stable, the framework um, that is in place, um, the better it is to attract investment. So in that sense, trade agreements do help to attract um, the investor. So, I mean, I, I can go on. I, I think what the most important for me is to unravel and unpack this development dimension and bring that together. What do you need to do if you talk a development di dimension and take that lens? What do you do in the rules area? What do you do in the facilitation area? How do we team up with what is um, within the climate world, the climate and the finance world, and make sure that trade is an integral part uh, within that? Um, uh, the unpacking of our development aid and certainly also calling on other donors uh, to step that up. Um, it, it will be that integrated approach, I think, that that, um, that is key um, uh, to make sure that indeed not only we are uh, developing and going through a green transition, but that that is a genuine global effort and that we help developing country in doing so. Thanks very much. Um, maybe, uh, Ms. Araya, would you like to come in here on, on the yeah, reflections? Sure. Yeah. I, I would like to talk about missed opportunities because I, I do agree very wholeheartedly with the point about capacity building. And of course, when it comes to low income developing countries, there is, there is a lot of catching up to do. At the same time, we know that when it comes to the G20, there are the G10s, right? Like countries that see themselves as more powerful, they want to be engaging with Europe and the US on equal, on equal basis and there is a lot of hedging going on they don't want to choose the EU only or the US or, or China they, they want to keep their their open an open door policy and the point that I have observed and I have you know it's, it's kind of a frustration I have when it comes to the EU in again I'll, I'll, it could be Africa but I'll, let me give you an example from Latin America where do you think the, the chargers for all the electrification that is happening in Latin America is coming from? I mean, 10% of the sales of new cars in Costa Rica are electric. 10%, think about it. And, and in the context of capacity building, the, the capacity building that messaging was, you, you, you still need to wait, you know, you're not ready for this, we'll do capacity building. In the meantime, China invested infrastructure you know it's electrifying taxis vans private cars um even heavy trucking in i mean european companies are insisting on selling diesel car diesel cars diesel trucks diesel bus so european companies lost the market in chile lost the market in colombia and are about to lose the market for buses in brazil and I cannot square this. It's like there is the Green Deal, there is the, no, the knowledge that the future for transportation is electric. And despite the Green Deal narrative and reality of it, because it is a reality, it's not just a narrative, the, the, the tech that is being sold and produced in Brazil that is being, uh, that what citizens and business people see is not the clean tech, is seeing, you know, diesel buses, diesel trucks. So my, my point with this example is that you can do a lot of capacity building. Yes, of course, but in, 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 the, in the middle income countries, especially the ones that really want to leapfrog, it is, obvious that there is no interest in investing in the manufacturing of clean technology in Brazil, in, the, in those countries. And so my point is, it is very, um, I think it is a moment from redefinition in the framing of this, because also 
in Europe, there is a tendency and I live here and I like it. So I'm saying this as a friend, not as a, as a critic. Uh, there is a tendency to say we are the leaders and we're gonna lead the world. But in, in practice, what people wanna hear is not that they have to follow. They wanna hear that they are going to co-create this, this clean tech future. They are going to co-create the partnerships and, and grow material. So my observation is, as I said, it's more of a missed opportunity, perhaps the answer from the companies that I have talked to, because I have talked a lot about this with the companies. I, I have a background in, in electrification. Um, and they said to me, in the most honest moments, they are honest people, they said, yeah, perhaps we took a lot of these markets for granted. So, so there is something there that I just wanted to unpack because I think that is probably how we can fix a lot of the, the um, tensions that sometimes there are about hypocrisy and all that, that um, can be quite difficult. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I would uh, also like to talk, uh, ask Mr. Janssen, what can the OECD do to not only, because you've been talking about uh, the members of the OECD having uh, basically the same values, but how can you as, uh, as, as an organization that's mainly based on, 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 on states that have the same value, how can you also build bridges uh, to those outside? And you said also that a lot of uh, the raw materials um, imports, they actually come from outside the OECD. So how would you say uh, an organization like the OECD can build uh, bridges to help uh, uh, build partnerships between uh, countries in Europe, for example, or the European Union and, and, and countries in the so-called uh, Global South? Well, uh, first point I would like to make is that we, um, our main role is to build bridges among our members. And I think um, Monica Araya's point in, in much of her argument, she made reference to relationships among our members and the concerns uh, Monica expressed, I would very much like to echo them. So I think the worst that maybe a worst case scenario for a region like the EU is if it loses partners like Chile, who are like-minded, who are part of our membership and who have um, important raw materials available. Um, or if um, it ends up um, not agreeing on how to proceed with the United States and Australia, who um, again share values, um, have raw materials available. So that platform to discuss with each other exists. Um, now, how come, however, that our members share values and nevertheless we need to build bridges, right? So apparently it's not uh, it's not working. Now that currently, it's currently not working because in this field of what is the right policy to um, help the, support the green transition, countries have different preferences for policies. In a simplified way, um, and it's very simplified, but a country like the United States likes to use price-based type of um, money, likes to emphasize the market mechanism, so they now use subsidies, invest. At the same time, for some reason, they can are politically not able to have carbon pricing mechanisms. Now, the EU has focused on carbon pricing mechanisms and likes to use regulations. And um, now you combine these two different approaches and you end up in an economic um, conflict situation where both have the same objective, but do it in a way where they find it hard to deal with each other. Um, now, EU and the US are both very big markets, but take then Chile, take um, Australia, take small New Zealand, um, they cannot at all play at equal footing in that uh, let's throw money at things uh, game. And they feel very um, unhappy in this situation because um, they would like to have strong relationships with their like-minded partners in the OECD, in particular because country like New Zealand is geopolitically in a, in a region that is, um, is tricky. So as a first point, um, we want to help um, building bridges. And we do this by bringing our members together and have them talk about what would be a correspondence, what, how can we match United States, your policy with the policy in the EU, where is your consensus to nevertheless deal with each other? And it's not only the two, but it's the entire membership. Um, 
sometimes we discover that may, there could be easy triggers to make something happen. For instance, when we look at the example of um, the carbon footprint standards that I mentioned before, there are pro currently probably four or five players globally that play um, an important role in that global market for carbon footprint monitoring. So we are considering to bring these five players together, and that should be feasible to bring them together and have them agree on something. Um, so this is among our membership. Do we reach out? Yes, we do. So for instance, I mentioned um, the export credit arrangement. Uh, there are non-OECD members like uh, Brazil that are partners in this. And that's important. You may have heard Sang Jun Lee saying that the Korean uh, government is uh, creating a coalition, export credit agencies are part of it. Um, and with that coalition, they want to help Korean companies to export, for instance, to Africa, uh, clean energy, invest in clean energy sectors, where the EU probably wants to do the same thing. And if there was no export credit arrangement, like the one we just negotiated, the EU and South Korea would be competing for the African market. That was actually a situation we were in. Now we agreed on the same terms. So what South Korea is now doing will not compete in an unfair way against the European uh, Union or against any other member we have. And uh, countries that are non-EU members are part of this. We, um, the responsible business conduct guidelines that were mentioned also by Madeleine, uh, also here we have countries that are member of the, this that are not OECD countries. Um, for instance, Morocco is an important partner in this. We are setting up increasingly partnership outside of the OECD. Madeleine also made reference to uh, EU's work with the ITC. We are, are uh, working on an MOU with the International Trade Center to work indeed together towards what are our RBC guidelines that uh, regions like the EU want to work with and how can we help countries, for instance, in Africa to meet those uh, standards, to align these things. So building bridges, above all, focus on among our membership, but definitely with a focus also on global engagement in order to also for our members to raise, remain in touch with the rest of the world. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for this, uh, yeah, very, um, Clear overview. Um, I, I would like to ask another question in the round, and that uh, is something that's been discussed uh, a lot lately, or at least in some quarters. Uh, the idea of uh, you know basing these partnerships on on, on like-minded states. So there, are some people would uh, call uh, for a, a so-called economic NATO, for example. Um, does that uh, make sense? Is that something that, in in light of the current uh, increasingly geopolitically tense situation is something that we should uh, envisage as a European Union, but also, for example, as, uh, as South Korea. So um, my question in the round is, um, anyone can, uh, is, can, can take it, um, is should we go down this path? Uh, um, allow me please to start with this because we are Oh, it's nearly our title, uh, Organization of Like-Minded uh, Countries. Um, I think this question you ask can be asked in different ways. Um, and the way you ask it, it sounds like, should we focus and maybe restrict to like-minded countries? That's one way of asking it. What we, we prefer to put it in a different way. Uh, given that we need to build bridges and to agree on certain things, maybe start with like-minded because it's easier but not exclusively leave this open and actually any agreement that uh, is meant to be recognized by the WTO, like Madeleine, we are the OECD, very strong WTO supporters. I spend a lot of my career there. Um, you have to, you can agree I mean, in subgroups, but you should remain open for other parties. So the export credit arrangement, for instance, small group, like-minded, open, to other um, to other countries, so that gives it a different a, um, a different spin, right? Like-minded as a first step to make it easier, but not as a first and last step, not an, as as an exclusive step, but with a view on being open. Thank you. Um, Korea, South Korea has uh, has of course a very strong neighbor, and that, that that that's China. And 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 how how does South Korea deal with these dependencies, and um, and how dangerous does it see that for its uh, economic security? And in that in light of that, do you think it it would make sense to 
uh, go for an approach that is more of a uh, like-minded country approach. Mr. Yeah, de definitely. Uh, as you uh, as you said, actually, South Korea faces a strategic dilemma between the U.S. and China on on the security front. U.S. the Korea has maintained a strong alliance with the United States for the last seven decades, and but on the economic front, actually, China. Uh, has been a number one trading partner since the early uh, 2000s. So between uh, these two uh, important policy areas, South Korea had to make a, a strategic maneuvering. But uh, in terms of economic security, uh, South Korea tried to uh, diversify away from China uh, for the last couple of years to reduce its structural vulnerabilities in dealing with China. So in that regard, I would say, uh, uh, reduction of structural vulnerability would be the number one priori priority of the South Korean government in terms of uh, uh, economic secu security. And also uh, in terms of the uh, green industrial policy, actually South Korean government has promoted the cooperation on the basis of two principles. One is that uh, what South Korea can contribute. And the second one is what the demands from what are the demands from the developing countries in that regard i i would like to emphasize that the south korea has made a lot of efforts entered or take advantage of the so-called niche market where the u.s both the u.s and uh, china does not place a high priority so in that regard south korea has strengthened international cooperation with the countries in the middle east Southeast Asia and Central Asia. And in terms of technology profile, the emphasis is on the green hydrogen, seawater desalination, and the construction of water and switch and land landfill gas power plants. Those are the kind of the areas where South Korea uh, can contribute in uh, the process of enhancing cooperation with the developing countries. And having said that also South Korea is very much interested in sharing experience with like-minded countries, particularly developing countries in Asia, uh, particularly uh, South Korean uh, small and medium-sized companies still having difficulties in uh, adapting to the NDCs. And uh, we better know that the, what is more feasible and what, what is not feasible in the short a time of span. So in that regard, uh, it's going to be good for, uh, for South Korea to share such experience with the developing and like-minded countries in the region. Last point I would like to highlight is that uh, South Korea has very rapidly increased the green ODA. Actually, for the last couple of years, the amount of green, green ODA increased by three times. And then that is one way of like uh, strengthening and enhancing cooperation with the like-minded countries as well as developing countries in the region, particularly countries in Southeast Asia. Thank you very much. Um, I see uh, Ms. Araya uh, seems to be interested in coming in. I, I give you the floor. Yeah, not, not, not very, not, not so much on the like-minded uh, country framing. I understand the point and, and I just think that right now is such a, difficult thing to achieve given that countries are, seem to be so um, focused on their differences. Um, the, the bigger point I wanted to make is that where there is a real pain point and, and we need to create a lot of spaces for, for conversations about solutions is around the, you know, this, this tension around the green versus green. So you, you have on the one hand, you know, like the climate space, celebrating the arrival of all these technologies, you know, finally renewable energy is getting cheaper, LEDs are getting cheaper. Um, and now you have this, this other story happening, which is, you know, this is extractive industries, it's going to hurt communities, it's going to hurt nature. And you have a lot of investments in nature, uh, in, in the space of nature, protecting, protecting it, you know, creating coalitions, um, and if we don't create a space for having for having um, this difficult conversation about the trade-offs that we are going to have to think about and, and discuss and, and verbalize and, and make explicit, um, there could be a lot of a lot of tension, a lot of backlash against uh, these clean technologies. So so it's more of an invitation of um, I mean we have the right people here. You know it's, it is, this has a very strong trade dimension. They use is 
probably the most advanced in, in, in having these difficult conversations because 27 countries, you know, in, in the Green Deal is very encompassing, you know, so, so there is something about the EU that is appealing in the sense of dealing with that complexity. And then, of course, the OECD is the other natural place for, for having this difficult conversation um, initially with OECD members that will disagree. Uh, but eventually, as, as we heard from um, our colleague, I, I cannot, I think it's Mariam, who, who said, you know, you cannot, you don't have to only restrict it to, to the members. But, um, but yeah, I just wanted to flag that tension because it, it's pretty, pretty painful right now. Thank you. I see Ms. Twiningel uh, would like to come in. Uh, we can't hear you. No, you I need your help to unmute. Yeah. I didn't find the button. I had to do Zoom on my mobile phone. No, thank you. I, I, the, the, the discussion is, is fascinating. I mean, in, in a way, what we are discussing, we always get a tendency to pinpoint at one thing that we need to do. And I think the complexity that we have in front of us is that we need to do many things at the same time. Um, so that's maybe three things that we picked up today. Um, I totally agree with um, with the OECD, uh, the standard setting in, in the broad sense is a very important one and it's taking place now. I mean, we are looking at carbon footprinting and methodologies um, and there are a couple of things that are right now taking place. There's a big interest in, in carbon pricing methodologies. Um, and, and we are engaging at all levels. I, I think our engagement in the OECD, it's, it's indeed has certainly added value, but we're also pushing hard for the discussions in the WTO. That's where we have a multilateral setting. But even in the way we are developing these methodologies for our um, CBAM, as it is, is a very open process. Um, and there's a working group, there's international partners participating in it. Uh, these will be presented and discussed. So it's really now the time that we need to discuss these things. Um, and, and we, by all means, have an interest in, in developing um, a common understanding of that. Um, at the same time, I, I do certainly hear um, uh, the, the, the query about from Monica about, um, yeah, if you say, I don't like it either, North-South division and, and sort of the perceptions that are out there. Um, we do think that we need to tackle that up front. Um, that's also going to take place in several fora. For us, it's an integral part in the WTO. And maybe to highlight here the initiative that um, is now with four co-leads, um, but was initiated by uh, uh, Vice President uh, Dombrovskis, Executive Vice President Dombrovski, to create at ministerial level um, minist trade ministers for climate uh, coalition. Um, and Remarkably, um, there's a significant number of developing, in particular, African countries that expressed an interest in this. And, and we really see that as, as now a forum to lift it out of all the technical discussions and have a political discussion um, on the role of trade. And, and there's a big uh, appetite also to reach out not only within a trade forum, but to link the dots with the finance and climate colleagues. So for me, that, that will be actually a good forum to hear and to have ministers here where the different perspective comes from to see what the common common base is. So standards sort of working on that, that political uh, framework um, and, and building the bridges. I, I totally agree with the, um, with the OECD intervention that it's not an exclusive forum that we're looking up. Uh, probably club and coalitions may give that impression. Inclusiveness is very important, openness. Um, and indeed, at some point, you need to start somewhere. So it's a very good, uh, and often we find that in the OECD, in the G7, or in, in other settings, uh, the, the role of an incubator um, is important. And of course, the OECD has a fantastic um, um, analytical capacity also and a convening power to, to bring that together. But we should, in parallel, uh, open these for and the WTO. Um, so these are the, the points that come to, to mind, having listened to what is here. But I, I think the main thing is we, we cannot focus on what we need to tackle these things in parallel um, because, and it will in the beginning be a bit of overlaps here and there. I agree, there are more initiatives, but but that that's because it's the urgency of the day. And at um, some point, if we bring in good common sense, we make sure that all of them are compatible and ideally come together. Yeah, thanks very much for this uh, very forward-looking uh, statement. I would like to now open the floor uh, for questions uh, to the panel. Um, you're very welcome to ask your questions. 
Yes. Um, maybe Ms. Janssen would like to take that one, or anyone else is also welcome, of course. For the good order, at, at least online, I could not hear the question. <laughs> yeah, we <laughs> no. Yeah, I would, uh, if, if you would like to reply to that. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to respond to some of the written questions. But... Thank you. Um, Peter Hitler, Policy Director of the Martin Center. Uh, one of the issues we have discussed in development policy over 60 years, I think, is intellectual property rights. And this is a crucial issue in, in triggering innovation. But of course, on the other side, companies are very reluctant to give up their latest uh, technologies. Um, is there any progress in the framework, be it the WTO or other uh, free frameworks we have created so far? Anyone would like to take that question? Okay. Um, I must admit, I've not been following the intellectual property rights discussion in the in most recent years. So my um, I, I don't have the impression that there has been any drastic change. Um, what we are maybe a bit seeing now in the industrial policy debate in the EU and US that uh, we have realized that companies that invested in China have been flexible on giving away intellectual property because they were hoping, well, they wanted to get access to a market, right? And um, and that has backfired. Um, but um, no, in, in general, that remains a very difficult issue. That said, I remember working with China at the WTO and uh, Chinese SMEs complaining about intellectual property theft by um, industrialized country multinationals. So um, there are different sides of the stories. Thank you. Um, if anyone else would like to come in, uh, now is your chance. Otherwise, I would say, uh, yeah, are there any more questions uh, from, from, from the audience? Yes, please. Hi, my name is uh, Clemens Rosmeier from the Industry Division of the Austrian Federal Economic Chamber. Um, it's a statement and then a question or ask for a comment from the from the audience. I've been a few minutes late, so maybe this has been mentioned before, but I have the, 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 I have the impression that one term, one thing is not really mentioned. It has been alluded to, which is the competitiveness of the European industry. So if we're saying new industrial policy, new partnerships, it's also about access to markets and access to raw materials. And in this regard, and this has certainly been alluded to with the word co-creation, that's maybe one additional thing that Europe has to offer and could also put a more focus on is value and supply chain creation in the partnering countries. So maybe that's maybe there's, there's comments on that from the audience as well. Thanks. Um, anyone would like to take this one? Mr. Ninga? Can you help on yep. mute? Um, sorry, you helped me already. No, I, I mean, I, I don't know if I hear exactly what I hear what you say, um, but I think I do. And I would coincide with the view that, um, I mean, we're, we're, we're operating in a global place. Huh? So um, for the competitiveness of the industry, it is important that uh, we're having a competitive uh, industry elsewhere. Um, so if that, if that is the question, um, but maybe I, uh, is, is this sort of a question rather EU competitiveness versus an other? For me, supply chains link us to others. So it, it, it's a false statement to believe that we can fix it all on ourselves and dictating around what happens and what should happen at our border. Yes. Um, if, if you want, because I saw, oh, sorry. I, I saw a question of Mercosur like and another. Hmm. Yeah, maybe to add um, something, and maybe it, it it is important for the European, the public in the European Union to be aware of this, the, um, the crisis situation in Ukraine and the change of relationship with Russia has had an important impact of, on that competitiveness. 
aspect, and in particular because of the um, higher impact on the change of energy prices in Europe than in other countries like the United States um, that have access to own um, energy sources. So um, this is something to be taken into account when we think about this value proposition question that Monica uh, raised. Uh, what is the strength of the EU as a partner? Anyone else? I just yeah. wanted to add something because this is, you know, it could go in, in different directions. Um, for me, the, the political part of this question is that there is a balancing act in Europe in the sense that it, in order to proceed with the Green Deal and to, and to look at citizens in the eye and get the buy-in, there has to be a lot of benefits from jobs, to see the investments, to see that the Green Deal is a better proposition than an economy that is polluting, that is based on fossil fuels and all that. So there is that political part of, of the European conversation and is to some degree anchoring democracy and it's about you know, getting the support when people vote. That's difficult. And at the same time, the same politicians are gonna have to somehow articulate that not every single part of the Green Deal and all these technologies will have to be produced in Europe. That in order to build partnerships with the world in Africa, in Asia, in Latin America, there has to be room for these countries to produce technology. There has to be the room for these countries to bring those technologies to Europe and to not block them and to partner with them because some of the raw materials needed for the Green Deal are in those countries. So we are not living in a world where those raw materials can just be taken and brought back and processed here. Or we, can, we cannot operate under the premise that uh, everything will lead to, you know, let's do all the mining in Europe because we don't want any mining from abroad because those are civilized countries, oh, God forbid, you know, like we, we cannot in this particular moment where we are with the fragility of, of a lot of the climate um, propositions for the public, we, we can't, it, it, as I said, it's a difficult balancing act of, you know, articulating why this is good, articulating why Europe can win, and at the same time, articulating that it has to be open for business with those countries. So, so I don't know if this answered the question of the gentleman who asked, but the point is, um, it, it is probably the new, the new step that the Green Deal a conversation in Europe has to take how Europe in the world, Europe in that fragmented world, and what Europe um, is going to offer in a in a in a way that is not eight, in a way that is more investment in trades and and standards and cooperation. Thanks very much. I think we're already arriving at the end of this policy dialogue. Um, thank you very much uh, to everyone on the panel for making it, whether online or in person. And also thank you very much for everyone who, who came um, in person and also joined us online. Um, um, I hope to see you soon again and wish you a good uh, journey back home. Thank you all very much. Thank you.